Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to start today with a little discussion. And so I'm going to ask you a question. And before I put the question up on the screen for you to read, I just want to say, like, I know that as Christians and in church and as Lutherans that uh, maybe we have a hard time speaking in in terms of any kind of uh, exaltation or, or um, promotion of our, ourselves, right? And so I recognize that, but I still think that we can have some healthy discussion around this question. And the question is, is this, what is your greatest accomplishment or maybe a, another way, what is your your greatest attribute, greatest quality about you. And so to get the ball rolling here, uh, I will go first, but Dan, if you could take the mic and be ready to go to people. And, uh, and, and, and Dan, you're kind of, uh, you're, you're in the line sight of, uh, of the camera right now. So, uh, and so if you could be on there and go stand back a little bit. Thank you. So, all right. So, greatest attribute, greatest accomplishment. Uh, there is definitely a time in my life, and I, I can look back at this time in my life, and one of my personal greatest attributes that, that I would uh, attribute to myself is my work ethic. Specifically, that has to do a, along with uh, football, right? I was not the fastest, I was not the biggest, I was not the strongest, I was not the most athletic person on the football team. But there is no one that spent more time in the weight room than I did. Uh, there is no one that spent more time at workouts than I did. And, and um, I can say, uh, and I, I, part of that work ethic for me came from my dad, who also worked incredibly hard. Uh, I'll also I'll go on to say, like, today, more recently, one of my, my greatest accomplishments, and, you know, tread lightly when I say it that way, but uh, I would just say uh, our family is uh, a, um, a family that is not perfect by any means, but we try to center our life in the Lord, and I remember before getting married, I used to uh, hope for, envision, uh, pray for, godly wife, godly children, and by God's, by God's grace, uh, that's my reality today. So those are, are two of the things that I would want, one attribute, one accomplishment in my life that I would throw out and say, these are some of the things that I, I think are the greatest things in my life. What about you? You guys have any any inputs? Donald. Um, well, that there, I, I, along with that, is also things I'm thankful for. It's because it's, it's like hard. You're right. It's hard to think about that, but um, for some reason, um, I and I, that's why I think it's a blessing or something. But I've always been wanting to connect with God, even as a little child. And um, I got really separated in college because I could. I kept going to churches and I couldn't find one. Um, and as, as you can see, I'm really picky. I came back from Maine because I couldn't find a church. But I've always been connected. And because of that, my children have some sense of a higher power in their own way. And, and to me, and I always, and Juliet would say to me, um, I don't even know the faith that you knew what you were saying to me when you said these things, but you knew it was the right thing to say, even if that moment you were feeling lost and in the middle of a divorce, and that you said things to me that I will never forget because I think that God was uh, chasing it or, or wanting me to be um, connected from such a young age, and 
Um, so, and my kids are both different in the way that they communicate with God, but because um, if I strayed away, I came back. Um, I feel like that that's why I'm here. That's why I'm in this wonderful community of um, loving people. And I went from being a pharmacist to playing music, which is an op- a totally opposite thing. And so that came from always coming back if I went away um, and being sort of um, tenacity determined to not run from God. And that's changed my whole life. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, so instilling faith <laughs> in your children yes. in particular. Yeah, so anyone else? Yeah, Don, go ahead. That's a tough question. It'd be so much easier if it was uh, less your great feelings. Okay, yeah. Good but, uh, yeah. Um, one, of, one, of, one of my uh, uh, great accomplishments is being associated with this congregation. When I came here first, I think around 2010 or 2012, it was like coming back home because I had been raised at LCMS, and, but had fallen away for quite a while. Uh, another accomplishment, of course, is uh, what Meredith and I have done sailing halfway around the world now in a uh, tiny 36-foot sailboat. But uh, we didn't do it alone. We did it with the uh, grace of God and the protection of Jesus. Really. And, and I uh, greatly appreciate just the general's um, desire to give God the glory right, in, all, in these things. But uh, yeah, relationship with this congregation, sailing around the world. Yeah, with Jesus. With, with Jesus, yeah, right. So, uh, Jesus, take the wheel, I guess. Yeah, uh, so, you know, to, anyone else that wants to uh, uh, share today? Okay. Then, I just have a real straightforward yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. looking for more country. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, for me, my greatest accomplishment, I think, was getting into med school because it wasn't easy. Okay. Uh, I applied the first time and uh, very poorly on the MCATs to test because uh, I didn't know general information. I was a bookworm and knew lots of science and math. And because of that, um, I ended up on a waiting list. And the waiting list ended up, I started at 16, I think, I ended up at 6 when school started. So I had a choice to make. Do I go on or do I persevere? Yeah. And so I became an orderly and intensive carrier for a year. I read next week in Time Magazine to beef up the general information part of my test score. And I reapplied, and guess what? I got on the waiting list again. Awesome. And I was 12 on the waiting list. And I actually got accepted a week before school started. So I had to chase out to Madison and find a place to live, and the rest is history from there. But so, so the attribute was probably perseverance. Perse- yeah, I was going to say, uh, intelligence factors in there a little bit, but perseverance might be uh, the, the one that really yeah, you're landing on. So, but yeah, so, I mean, uh, you know, some other thoughts I had, and I, re- I recognize discussion here might be limited, uh, but uh, yeah, academic success or accomplishments, sporting success or accomplishments, maybe making the, the game winning shot. Like my daughter Joy did yesterday in one of her basketball games. Uh, there, there, there's a big accomplishment. Maybe uh, there's financial uh, uh, success uh, accomplishments somewhere that's um, happened. And, and of course, we all, we're going to temper that or see that through the lens of you know God's grace poured out on us. At least as Christians, we ought to. But we also should be aware of the of the fact, well, when we go outside of the, these four walls, we can, we do have goals. We do uh, 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 aspire to accomplish certain things in life. And so hopefully that gets us uh, uh, into our sermon a little bit today. Um, we're in Lent. We're in a series, uh, our Lenten series called Giving It Up. And uh, Lent is, is a time where we focus on giving things up for Lent, like chocolate or social media or whatever the case.
takes money, but also we, we focus on repentance, right? And, and Luther says this, that the, the whole Christian life is a life of repentance. We say this very regularly. But here in, in Lent, during this season, we focus on repentance. And according to the Lutheran Confessions, uh, repentance, there's, there's two parts of, of, of repentance. A contrition for our sin, and that comes mainly from the, the preaching of the law, God's law, and shows us our, our sin, right? But then also a faith in Christ. So repentance has, has both uh, contrition for sin and faith in Christ. And faith, where, where does that come from? How is that still with us? How, how are we able to do that? Well, through the preaching of the gospel, through the preaching of our uh, uh, Lord Jesus Christ and his cross and the forgiveness of sins. And so we're, we're going to focus on this season, this Lenten season, uh, giving certain things up and specifically... We're going to take a look at things it's like worldly wisdom. A little bit more about that as we get into our text. But let's uh, let's get into our text. If you've got your Bible, I encourage you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll be starting at verse 18. And just a little context for, uh, for this letter written by the Apostle Paul, right? So 1 Corinthians, Corinth uh, was, is a city in Greece that uh, the Apostle Paul planted a church in a few, a, a few months, maybe a couple of years uh, before writing this letter. It's, it's a city, it's one of the big cities in the Roman Empire, and so uh, has some uh, big city issues along with it. It's a, a cultural crossroads, and so... The way that this that it sits, Corinth sits on um, um, the on, on Greece is it's right on the what's called an is, is, I'm sorry, I'm gonna say isthmus. Yeah, thank you. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, isthmus. And, and um, what what does that mean? It, it means like there's on either side of it some water that comes in, and and, and then there's a little bit of land that shoots that crosses the water. And then the, the land gets bigger again. And so, essentially, if you want to go from north to south Greece, you go through Corinth. If you want to go from west, going from uh, on, on the ocean or on the sea, a lot of times what people would do, more uh, often than not at that time, is they would take their ship to Corinth, take all their stuff off their ship, do the five, I don't know, was it a five mile hike or so across land, get in another ship, and then continue sailing. And that by doing that, that saves them some hundreds of miles in sailing. So Corinth was a um, cultural crossroads, quite literally, by land and, and by sea. It's a young church, again, planted by the Apostle Paul. And Paul is, is writing response to some issues that, that he's heard about. So Paul's no longer in Corinth, but he's got word that there are some issues in the Corinthian church that he needs to address. And one of, maybe the main issue that the Apostle Paul is addressing is the issue of division. Divisions Within the church. Go back with a couple of verses before our text. Look at verse 10. The Apostle Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but you be united in the same mind, in the same judgment. So that, here's the issue, and if we read through the letter of 1 Corinthians, I mean, we, we see this issue come up again, we'll, we'll see it come up around the Lord's Supper uh, in chapters 10 and, and 11, but here, it's not so much that Paul is talking about the, the Lord's Supper, he'll, he'll get to that, 
But what are the divisions in the church? What's causing strife within the membership? Well, it's this understanding of, of wisdom and power and strength and status that is seeping into the congregation. You know, think about it. You probably, the Corinthian church probably had people from a uh, high class and people from the from a lower class. People who were well-educated and people who weren't as well-educated. Masters and slaves, all kinds of different people were in the Corinthian church. And we, we should understand a little bit about the about Greece, about the, the Greco-Roman culture. They, they prided themselves on wisdom. Is anyone here uh, a philosophy major? No? Okay. Has anyone heard of Socrates or Plato or Aristotle? Right? All three of those are, uh, are, are great um, philosophical minds from the Greek culture before the life of, of Christ and before the life of the Apostle Paul. And to this day, if you take a philosophy class, uh, you'd be hard-pressed not to hear those names thrown out and, and talked about and discussed. The Greeks really valued the wisdom that, that they had. But then here's the problem. Sometimes that wisdom, and here's what we're saying, wisdom in quotes, led to division, led to strife, led to hurt. Uh, not only did, did was Paul uh, talking about wisdom here, but a couple other things that he briefly touches on, he touches on powers, what power, what does what is he say? So, um, for since, in verse 21, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through the through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs. Now, Paul doesn't talk about uh, Jews in much, as much in this letter as he does in, say, Galatians. Or Romans, but specifically, we know that what were Jews looking for at that time? They're looking for in, in a Messiah. They're looking for a Messiah with power, Messiah with signs. Show us, show us a sign that you're going to come in and politically uh, lead a revolt and free the Jewish people from Roman authority, right? Roman captivity, in a sense. Jews, um, uh, let's see, Jews demand the sign and Greeks seek wisdom. Prove it to me. Prove me into the faith. But what does Paul say? But we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to Jews. And folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Think about it. When we think about power and strength, generally speaking, in the world, the first thing that comes to mind, it has more to do with with how buff a person is, how much time they spend in the weight room, how, how, how much horsepower uh, a truck has, how much towing capacity. We don't think of death or a man dying on the cross as powerful. Right? Wisdom, uh, we think of, of recent arguments. Uh, we, we think of uh, maybe it could be um, science or uh, soft sciences like psychology or sociology. All of these are, are good in, of, in and of themselves, but they aren't the type of wisdom that 
shown to us on the cross. In fact, for many people looking at the cross, we see foolishness, folly. The, the Greek word is where we get our English word today, a, a moron from. Uh, it's pretty harsh here, right? And this is uh, this has always been the case. We see this. This was this letter Paul is writing back in say uh, 55 A.D. Shortly after that, one of the first uh, depictions of the cross that we have is is called the. Uh, let me let me try to uh, pronounce this right. The Alex Menos Graffito. It's referred to this, and so on the left is is the graffiti. It's, this image is uh, scraped into or carved into plaster inside of a house on, on a wall inside of a home, right? And and the, on the right, it, it just clarifies kind of. It's really hard to make out the, that image, right? But on the right, we can see what that image is intending to be. And what we see is someone on a cross. You can kind of make out the cross there. But what's the the head of that being? It's like a horse or a donkey, right? And I should say that this was it's hard to date this specifically or, or accurately, but somewhere around 200 AD that this was created and we've, we found this. And those letters, the writing, they say this, Alex Amenos worships his God. So most people understand this to be, well, graffiti, right? Like, uh, there's uh, 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 other names for this uh, blasphemo, blasphemy, uh, graffito, right? Uh, this is seemingly someone making fun of this man named Alex Meadows, uh, um, making fun of his faith. How foolish that he worships a God who hangs upon a cross. That's so, such folly in that, according to to worldly wisdom. What's Paul's concluding point? What's he hoping to get there, get to uh, from there? We read this in the, at the end of our text, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 31. Let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. We don't boast of our our wisdom or our accomplishments or our power or our strength or our class that we're uh, born into. We boast about Jesus. Because what Paul wants more than anything else at this point is for the church to be united. So we can we can think about this, and it's pretty easy, at least for me, to point the fingers out to the world and, and say, see, that's just some worldly wisdom, maybe around the creation and evolution discussion. Uh, well, we can see, like, God, God can raise a dead man from the grave. God can also speak into existence our world <laughs> and we can we can believe in that but in the eyes of the world that can be seen as foolish or oh things like relationships before we get married you should probably date a long time have a long engagement that's the the thing in the world, you know, I, I um, heard one, one person put it this way, that uh, before you buy a car, you test drive it. Before you get married, you should probably test drive it. You can imagine where that was going. Um, 
point, maybe in worldly wisdom, to things like the issues around life. When does life begin? We would say at conception, as Christians, but in the eyes of the world, <laughs> you're, you're just a woman hater. That's foolish for you to, well, to find when, when does life begin, right? We, we, we can look at all of these things where we can point at worldly wisdom and its folly compared to the wisdom of, of God, but we should also look at ourselves, right? Um, and as believers, we're continuing to be sanctified. We're continuing to grow in our faith in the Lord. And sometimes, I might not say this in a discussion before a sermon, <laughs> sometimes we can think about the things that we've done right to merit our salvation. We reasoned our way into belief, right? So we've studied all the, the, the things that are out there, all the all, all philosophical arguments, all the different religions, and we just, we found that Christianity is the best one. Now, hey, we study, that, that's good, but it's not the source of our, our faith. Or, how about um, we made a decision to follow Christ. And we put all our emphasis on that decision that we made. Or how about this? Maybe we we look at our status as Christians or as Lutherans. I served at this church for four decades now. And there's implied behind that saying uh, this the, the thought of like well, I've earned my way. I, I, I should have a little bit more say in the unity of or in what happens in this church. Or response to that will be like, could be something like, really? Well, that's great. My great, 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 great grandfather was CFW Walther. And he came off the, the boat of Germans from Saxony that sailed over and established in 1840. That, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod in Perry County, Missouri. Whew. And then the next person can say, well, my lineage actually traces all the way back to Martin Luther. <laughs> we can start to, to think like, huh, maybe there is something special about me. Of course God would say we, we can, well, or Maybe we, we focus on the right decisions that we've made. Well, my morals are better than, than other people, so of course I have a happy family and a, a, a secure marriage. <laughs> the, the thing that we, we need to keep in mind here is we're, we're not against science or reason or wisdom or power or nobility or what whatever like that's not the, the point here. The point is where does that all fall in regard to God's word? So uh, let's talk about the role of wisdom and talk about both either the magisterial or the ministerial effects of wisdom or, or understanding of wisdom. Magisterial <coughs> My brain, Majesty, you can hear it. My brain is number one. That, that rules. And so I have to reason myself into the faith. Uh, and we, we hold intellect up above everything else, including the Word of God. And so here's intellect, here's reason, and there's the Word of God, and I stand over it. And what, what, what happens there is, well, when we look at the Word of God, we find a verse that we don't like, that's hard for us, we can maybe dismiss those verses. However, as Christians, what we, we hold to is what's referred to as a ministerial role of wisdom. 
minister as in a servant role of wisdom. The magisterial role belongs to God's word. And so we've been given wisdom, we've been given science, we've been given reason, we've been given schooling, we've been given intellect, we've been given all these things. However, all of that stands underneath the word of God. It stands underneath the cross of Christ, the foolishness of God, because the foolishness of God is uh, wiser than our wisdom. God had this understanding to call us into faith. Why are we here? Why are we gathered together as a church body? It's not because we're so smart. It's because God's called us. He's called us together as a family. As a family on mission. He's called us by the power of Christ. He is taking care of everything that is a hindrance, a block between our relationship with him and our relationship with one another. He has called us and done so for eternity, for Christ's sake. When we look at the cross, we recognize that's the wisest thing that this world has ever known. Last week, we had our first committee meeting of uh, the, the committee for chancel enhancement, right? And one thing that came out clearly, uh, loudly in that discussion, as we look at how we can beautify this, this area, and one thing that made my heart as a pastor very happy is that everyone in the committee said, how do we make the cross more prominent, more bold? How do we get it to stand up more? Because that is what our faith stands on, rests on. It's the, the cross of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness that he has given to us. So here's the, the question that I want to leave us with. And if you want, you can take out your worship bulletins here. Notice, do have a couple questions under the sermon notes here. What good news is, is God saying to you today? You know, for me, it has nothing to do, my salvation has nothing to do with my work ethic, it has nothing to do with my family, it has nothing to do with anything that I've done. Has the, everything to do with the fact that Jesus has called me to follow him. And then the second question is, in what way is worldly wisdom hindering your worship of Jesus? And I wrote it a little differently here. Uh, or your relationship with other Christians? Is there a way where your pride, your wisdom, your power is getting in the way of your relationship with others, God and other followers of Christ. And what might be some ways that you can give that up this Lent so that you can follow Jesus more, more closely. May God always call us by the power of the cross, who has sanctified us, who has justified us, and he sent his Holy Spirit to give us power, his power, to follow Jesus and to love, love each other.